Welcome to the biology section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 16 to 20. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can attempt them on your own. Here's question 16, question 17, question 18, question 19, and question 20. Okay, now let's go through the questions together and go through all the different answers. So in question 16, we're asked which of the following components can be found in plasma. So plasma is the liquid part that's floating around in your blood. So in plasma, we have things like red blood cells, we have electrolytes floating around, sugars, and we also have some proteins in plasma as well. So the first is globulins. Yes, this is something which can be found floating around in plasma. These are different types of proteins. They can be enzymes, they can be involved in the immune response as well. So globulins are present in the plasma but two platelets are not. So this one is not present in the plasma. So three clotting factors, that's fine. Clotting factors are found in floating around in plasma, but to initiate the clotting cascade, what needs to happen is a blood vessel needs to be damaged. And so platelets, those are stored inside the walls of the, walls of the blood vessels so that when you get a damage, when damage occurs to the blood vessels somehow, then the wall is ruptured and then the platelets can come out and then the whole clotting cascade can be initiated with the clotting factors that are already in the plasma. But it's not always that we have platelets floating around in plasma. So they are only brought out when they're needed. And so that's not something which we can regularly find floating around in the plasma. Otherwise you have clots forming when they shouldn't be forming. So in this case, two is incorrect. So C is going to be our correct answer. Options one and three only. In question 17, it sees a sudden rise in luteinizing hormone in a premenopausal female signifies what? So luteinizing hormone, there's a sudden rise of it. You should know that whenever we have this sudden peak of a lot of luteinizing hormone being secreted, that initiates some event. And the correct answer is D. So it should always be linked in your mind that when I have a a surge in luteinizing hormone levels, that means that ovulation is about to take place. So D is correct. Ovulation is imminent. Ovulation is about to occur. So that is what that peak in luteinizing hormone represents. Option A is incorrect. It's saying the destruction of the corpus luteum. No. So the follicle around the ovum, it'll become the corpus luteum afterwards. And then depending on if there was a fertilized egg or not, then the corpus luteum, it might either be destroyed or it can remain and for a while secrete progesterone. So it depends on whether fertilization took place or not. But this takes place in a different part of the, the whole reproductive cycle. It's not, it's not related to this rise in luteinizing hormone. B is saying this signifies that menstruation and the uterine lining shedding are imminent. No. This is kind of a different phase. So you have the whole ovulation phase and then the the menstrual part where you get the, the shedding of the uterine uterine lining, but that will go on afterwards. So after luteinizing hormone, there's a surge, then we get ovulation. And then afterwards, if there is no, if there is no fertilization, then we don't get the egg embedding into the uterine lining. And then that's when it's shed. So once again, just like with A, it's a different part of this whole reproductive cycle. And then C, it indicates that fertility is decreased. No, that would be incorrect. If anything, it would tell us that fertility is increased because ovulation is about to take place. This is like the time now to try to conceive and get pregnant. So C is incorrect. So D is the correct answer for question 17. In question 18, it says urate oxidase. It's an enzyme found in organisms from bacteria to mammals, and it catalyzes nucle nucleic acid degradation. Although humans have the gene, it's non-functional. Which of the following would best help identify the recency of the loss of function? So this entire first part of the question isn't really that important. What you need to know is humans have this gene, but it's non-functional. So we have the gene for this enzyme, but it's non-functional, so we don't actually use it. So what can we do to find out how recently we lost the function? So when we're talking about how recently humans are not able to like use this gene, how recently this event took place, we're going to be talking about evolution. So looking at our ancestors, like where along this evolution tree did we lose 
this ability to use this enzyme. Like our closest ancestors, do they also not use this enzyme? Do they have a non-functional copy? Or do they have a functional copy and it's really just homo sapiens that don't use this enzyme? So that's what we should look at. We should look at the evolutionary tree and our close relatives to see like how they compare to us in terms of this gene. So we're looking for an answer like that. Option A is saying to f discover like the recency of this loss of function, we can take a measurement of the degree of mutation of this gene as compared to other functional genes. That's not correct. So if we just try to see how much of mutation there is in this gene compared to other functional genes, it kind of implies that, that there was too much mutation going on inside this gene, which made it non-functional, but then other functional genes like they might have fewer mutations or something that isn't really true like even functional genes can have mutations in them and the degree of mutation that occurs in a certain gene it isn't just like it, it, it's it's random like we can't just say that because this one has more of a degree of mutation compared to other genes that's why it's non-functional there might be other genes which have more mutation but you know they're still fully functional so mutation it's random and then it can also be dependent on certain things like if you really need a gene for the survival of the species it's going to be like a highly conserved gene and like within genes there are some highly conserved regions so some things that are important they are going to survive and not have mutations in a population because if there was a mutation then that organism would die off right so it wouldn't be able to pass on that mutation so there's so many other factors going on in mutation occurring that we can't say that just looking at the degree of mutation of a gene is the best way to see like how recently we lost its function and most importantly this isn't really answering the question we want to know how recent it is looking at the degrees of mutation wouldn't exactly tell us how recently humans lost this gene this enzyme b is saying a comparison of primate and other mammalian genes to identify the related species with the mutation in common yes that's good we look at primates, we look at other mammals, we compare our genes with them, and then we want to see, like, do we have the mutation in common? And like I said before, if we do have it in common, then okay, both us and this other species had this mutation, so like a common ancestor of ours, then we look back and see if that common ancestor had the mutation or not. Like, we can trace it back to see where this non-functional enzyme actually started coming about. So that would be the best thing. C is saying an analysis of the number of nucleotides in the gene to assess the chances of mutation. No, similar to A, it's not like a direct relationship. So first of all, like mutations is complicated. And then second of all, it's not a direct relationship between the number of nucleotides in a gene to how many mutations there are. That doesn't really tell us like the chances of mutation. Mutation, once again, is still random, but then there are other factors, like if something's highly conserved, then there's gonna be not that many mutations. So yeah, looking at the number of nucleotides is not good and it's not like really relevant for what we're studying it wouldn't give us the correct thing that we're looking for and secondly it's not even going to help us identify how recently we lost this function of the enzyme and finally in d it sees a test of whether reverting the gene to a functional form is lethal in humans if we had a test and we tried to make the gene f uh, into a functional form first of all that is very unethical like if we tried to make if we tried to play around with a certain gene and see if a person dies like that's not even ethical it's not an experiment which would happen but once again it doesn't answer what we're looking for even if you converted like this gene to its functional form you're testing for something else now now you're seeing like if i turn this gene on would it actually be lethal to humans or not it doesn't answer like why the enzyme became non-functional in the first place and that's that's also not what we're looking for the main question that we're asked is like how can we find out how recently we lost the function of this enzyme? And D does not answer that question. It's, it's talking about something else. So D is also incorrect. In question 19, we're asked which of the following is accurate regarding cardiac signal conduction. So cardiac signal conduction, that is setting the pace of the heartbeat. So you should know that the heartbeat, the main pacemaker cell, is first of all the SA node. From there, the signal is conducted to the AV node. So SA node to the AV node, and then it goes through other things like the bundle of His, the Purkinje fibers, 
those things, they come afterwards. But key point here is SA node comes first and then AV node comes after. So option A is saying electrical signals travel from the AV node to the SA node. No, that's incorrect. First of all, it's the SA node that depolarizes and has its signal. And then the AV node is slower and then signal goes from SA to AV. Option B is saying the AV node is slow to depolarize compared compared with the SA node. And yeah, that is correct. That is what I was just saying. The AV node relatively compared to the SA one is slower to depolarize. So we want to see which one is accurate and that is accurate. It depolarizes more slowly. And so that's why the signal goes from SA to AV and then onwards. Option C is saying the electrical signal travels from the SA node to the AV node via the bundle of Hiss. So that is incorrect because the the nerves that come afterwards from the AV, so going away from the AV node and then towards the rest of the heart, those are, that's the bundle of his. That comes after the AV node. And option C is implying that in between the SA node and AV node, that's where the bundle of his is. So that's why that option is incorrect. And then finally, D is saying Purkinje fibers assist with atrial depolarization. No, that's incorrect. They help assist with ventricle depolarization. So Purkinje fibers are near the end of this conduction pathway and they're near like the bottom of the heart where the ventricles are. So you should know if you know the different regions of the heart and the way in which conduction takes place, then you know that the Purkinje fibers are near the bottom and they assist with ventricle depolarization. So that's how you know that D is incorrect. In question 20, we're asked in which phase of mitosis do chromosomes align along the equator of the cell? So we want to know when they al align along the equator. So for this, you just need to know the four main stages of mitosis and then what occurs in each. So for that, just the order is just P, MAT, so P, M, A, T. First of all is option D, prophase. That's when the, the DNA condenses down into like the chromatin so that it can be more easily copied and separated. That occurs in prophase but that's not aligning along the equator. So we can remove option D. After that, we have metaphase, and that is correct. Metaphase is the one in which the chromosomes actually align along the equator. So that's the key thing that takes place in metaphase. B, anaphase is incorrect. That's when the chromosomes are, the sister chromatids or whatever, the chromatids are being pulled apart. So after being lined up in the equator, then they're pulled apart. So that pulling apart takes place in anaphase. So that's what, that's not the one in which they align along the equator. And then C, telophase, that is when we have this new wall being built between the two cells so that we have two new cells instead of just one big cell with a lot of DNA. So that is the final part of mitosis and it's not when we have chromosomes aligning along the equator. So A is the correct answer for question 20. And that's it for the questions in this, in this video. If you liked what you saw here, if you want to see a lot more questions and then us going through the answers, make sure to check out our course on teachable.com. The link is in the description below. Otherwise, make sure to subscribe to our channel and keep up to date whenever we have a new video going through more questions. That's it for this video. 